Amen, amen. How's everybody doing? Good. Oh, don't leave now, Joe. We're just heating up. No, I'm just kidding. That was cute. Um, no, it was good. Hope to see you next Sunday, Chunk or Treat. Um, do want to just uh, just follow up on an announcement that we made Friday uh, via Facebook. Um, uh, many of you know the, the Larrabee family. Uh, Dan Larrabee and, and Sam and Josh Larrabee, Lori Larrabee, Dan's wife, got a call Friday afternoon about 2.30 um, that Dan, in Josh's words, which I thought was just very fitting, um, that, that Dan had gone home to be with Jesus. And that's what, that's what Josh had told me and, and uh, shared with me. And, and so <clears throat> for some of you that, that know Josh and, and, and the family, the Larrabee family, Dan worked for a lot of years at South Portland Fire Department, um, loved that, was a servant in our community. Um, <clears throat> Josh was on staff here uh, for a few years as associate pastor and did, did some different things uh, a few years ago. Dan was an elder um, for part of that time, part of the pastoral team of South Coast before we merged. Um, Josh uh, is now serves over at East Point on their on their staff and is doing a phenomenal job and uh, just love what God's doing through him. His brother Sam serves on staff at Life Church um, uh, out west, and so uh, you can that just kind of tells you the type of father that that Dan was. Um, both his boys in ministry, both of his boys loved him so dearly. And it, it, the history for their family even goes back a little bit further because the Larrabee family was a part of South Gorham years ago uh, as a family when the boys were young. And so uh, they, I remember the first conversation I had with Dan about the merger. He was so excited to kind of see um, things coming together. Um, and I know he wanted to be a part of that process. And, uh, what an awesome guy. And I tell you all of that to tell you, obviously, um, some of us in here are mourning this morning, grieving uh, the loss of Dan, celebrating that he, and a little bit jealous, to be honest with you, Dan and the, where he is right now. He's home. He's worshiping this morning. He is pain-free. Um, Dan had had both of his legs amputated, his second one very recently over the summer. Um, Dan is n- not feeling any of that. And um, so I praise God for that. Uh, but also, uh, we found out yesterday the services are Wednesday morning. And so I just want to share those with you real quick. And we'll put this on our Facebook page as well, just so that everybody knows. Uh, they're going to do a visitation at 8 a.m. and then a service at 10 a.m. at East Point Christian Church in South Portland. It's where the Bob's discount used to be. It's across the street from Han- uh, Hanford Home Depot um, over there. And there's some folks... Mindy over here is organizing some folks this afternoon here uh, to make some baked goods for those services as well. So if you can stick around and help with that, I know she would appreciate that, but just trying to serve them well and love them uh, well. I did check in with Josh yesterday, and um, he just did say thank you for all the prayers and support from Summit and from friends and family that they have here. And so just wanted to share that with you this morning. Um, And so I just want to pray again for the Larrabee family and for us as we open God's word this morning. So would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much that we can find comfort today in the fact that Dan is worshiping with you this morning. And God, thank you that uh, you've made a way for that. But I do pray for Lori and for Josh and for Sam um, as they miss their husband, as they miss their dad. And just pray that you would comfort them and that they would feel your presence in this time. And uh, God, we just do pray that for the Larrabee family. And God, I do pray over the rest of our time this morning that you'd speak to our hearts through this message. And God, we give you this time. I pray against distractions, just that we'd be able to focus on you today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. So, we've been in a series for the last few weeks where we're looking at the seven I am statements. We're looking at the statements that Jesus made about himself, right? And and what we're doing here is we're trying to get to know Jesus deeper. In the last three chapters of the book of John, this book where we've been talking about the theme is that Jesus is better than, right? Jesus is better than. Jesus is greater than. 
the last three chapters of this book, chapters 14, 15, and 16, they take place in the last 48 hours of Jesus' life. And so there's a sense of urgency that begins to build as Jesus is heading to the cross. And so today we're going to cover, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Um, uh, and the way I want to set this up is, have you ever been... Have you ever been on a trip, or have you ever been on a mission trip, or been on vacation, or, or maybe just at work, and you've had the thought, I'm ready to go home, right? Anybody? I'm just, I'm ready to go home. Kristen and I, uh, we were in Colorado uh, in July, and it was just the two of us, we were kid-free, and, and, and I was warned before we went to Colorado uh, that, that one of the things I was going to notice was traffic. Anybody ever been to Colorado? Let me tell you something. The traffic is terrible, okay? It's terrible, all right? And, um, and I do remember the traffic. But Kristen and I, it, it, it didn't really seem to bother us, except when we almost missed our flight on the last day because we were stuck in traffic. But other than that, it didn't really bother us because, man, we were kid-free in Colorado. The kids were thousands of miles away. We could sleep. Like, we could eat without fighting to say, eat your dinner, sit in your seat. You know, anyway, I won't tell you what we say, because some of you may not agree with everything that we say. But anyway, that's beside the point, right? But we were, you know, it didn't really seem to bother us. But there was a point in time, there was a point in time while we were in Colorado, where we both kind of looked at each other, and the scenery was gorgeous. Like, we were, we were there, and it was awesome, and, and like, we were just loving it. And we kind of looked at each other a couple days before we headed home, we were like, you know what? ready to go home. Like, it just kind of hit us, both at kind of the same time. And it wasn't the company that we were with. It wasn't the scenery that was around us. There was just a draw. There was a pull to home. We actually kind of missed our kids. Isn't that weird? Kind of missed them. And so, like, there was a pull to home. There was a draw to home. They didn't miss us, but we kind of missed them a little bit. And so, and, and, and I remember being on mission trips in the Dominican Republic. I've, I remember, you know, anytime I go on a trip to Johnny and Friends, and especially when I don't take my family, um, there's, a, there's a moment in time where I get to the place where I'm like, you know what? This is awesome. I love what God's doing here. I love how God's using me here, but I'm ready to go home. Anybody ever felt that? Like you've been on a trip and you're like, man, I'm sitting on the beach. I'm loving this, but I'm ready to go home. There's a draw to home, isn't there? There's a pull to home. And so one of the things that I'm learning about myself is that regardless of where I am, regardless of the scenery, regardless of who I'm with, after a certain period of time, I want to go home. And the thing that we're going to kind of set up for us this morning and we're going to talk about this morning is that we're all hungry to get home. We're all hungry to get home. And, and our destination, the home that we're talking about, right, is heaven, eternity, eternal life in heaven. And Jesus is going to address this kind of yearning and desire for a home in John chapter 14. But to set it up even more, let's talk about the disciples for just a minute. The disciples at this point, they're all in on Jesus, right? I mean, they're all in on Jesus. They've left businesses, they've left homes, they've left clear succession plans. In this day, in the day of John 13, and the day of John 14 with the disciples and Jesus that we're talking about this morning, you became what your father was. So, if your father was a fisherman, you'd take over the business, the fishing business. If your father was a carpenter, you would become a carpenter. These disciples left their father's Right? They left their fathers, they left those businesses, and they went all in on Jesus. They said, we're going to follow you, you're the Messiah, we believe you're the Son of God. And in their heads, they're thinking, this is going to be the man who overthrows the Roman Empire. He's going to establish the kingdom the Old Testament had promised us. And we're banking our lives, all of our lives, that this is the one. And then all of a sudden, in John chapter 13, Jesus starts to say, I'm only going to be here a little bit longer. In fact, let's look at it. John chapter 13, verse 36. It's not going to be on the screens, but let me read it to you. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow me afterward. Now, can you imagine being one of those disciples and hearing Jesus say, where I'm going, you can't follow. After giving your whole life, 
walking away from your family, walking away from your business, walking away from your succession plan, giving your whole life to this person, and then him saying, listen, I'm about to go someplace, and you can't follow me now, but you will follow me afterwards. And then Peter, being Peter, said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. I will do more. You notice what he's saying? I'll do better. I will, (laughs) you know, let me follow you. Let me follow you. I'm better than the rest of these guys. You have to take me with you. And Jesus says, will you lay down your life for me? And truly, truly, I say to you, and this is where Jesus tells him, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. And so in John chapter 13, he's saying, I'm only going to be with you a little bit longer. Then I'm going to leave you guys. I only have a little bit more time on this earth, and then I'm gone. And the disciples start freaking out. They're wrestling with doubt. They're confused. And then Jesus is going to address that doubt in John chapter 14. But it's Thomas' questions and Jesus' response at the end of this text that we're going to read, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 7, to those questions that I want to spend our time on today. You with me? All right, all right, let's go. John chapter 14, starting in verse 1, Jesus says, Jesus is writing, I mean talking here, uh, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Now, it's interesting, and if this is your first time with us, I promise I'm not going to stop after each and every verse. I promise we'll get through this thing, okay? It's interesting here, and we have to pause. Let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Don't you think the disciples, as they're hearing this, can, can kind of say, well, we're here, right? I mean, we're here. We, be, we believe in you. We're with you, right? We're with you. We've given up everything for you. We've already addressed that just a few moments ago. But Jesus is saying, let your hearts not be troubled. What he's saying is, trust me. And I want you to see that he's after something deeper here. What's Jesus after? Jesus is after their heart. Jesus isn't after their comfort. Jesus is after their heart. And that's a big point for us to grasp here this morning because we're going to say some tough things this morning. We're going to talk about some deep things this morning. And there's some places that the text goes that we have to go. And, 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 and what I want us to realize, what I want us to recognize from the very beginning, let your hearts not be troubled. Jesus isn't after our comfort. He's after our heart. Let's keep reading. Let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Okay, see, we made it through two verses there, but we've got to stop. He says, I go to prepare... This, and, and the reason we have to stop is I believe, I believe that this is one of the most beautiful promises in Scripture, and this is one thing that we ought to just get so excited about in the church of Jesus. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, would I have told you? Now let's pause for just a moment. That means that Jesus has, has prepared and set up, is preparing, is setting up a destination, a place for you. That's cool. Like, that's awesome. Creator of the universe, Savior of the world, Jesus is telling His disciples and all of those who would believe in Him later that He's going to prepare a place for them. That He's going to prepare a place for us. Now, second part. And if I go to prepare a place for you, what does it say? I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Now, first of all, Jesus gives the promise, he's coming back to get us. He's not just setting up a place for us that we're never going to get to, right? I, uh, when, when Chris and I went to Israel years ago, about six months after we got married, so this was a few years ago, and, uh, and we, we were there, and I, I'll never forget, we went to this place called Mount Masada. It was one of my favorite favorite stops on the trip to Israel. We're in this place called Mount Masada. It's in southern Israel, and, and, and you go, and there's deserts everywhere, and you can hike up, but we were with like 200 other people, so we took the gondola up, and it was awesome. You got to see all the scenery. You get to the top of Mount Masada, and, um, and, and, you, can, and you can overlook the Dead Sea. It's amazing. It's beautiful. Absolutely gorgeous. But guess what's on the top of Mount Masada? A palace that was built for King Herod. You know what's interesting about this palace that was built for the king? He never went there. 
And like when you're walking around the top of this mountain, you're walking around, it was built as a safe haven for him where if he needed to escape to some place, right? Someone was after him, he needed to escape to some place, he could escape to Mount Masada and he would be safe. And it was this, it was this beautiful place. I mean, there were still um, some paintings on the wall and some different colors that you could see and all the space that was there. It was like, man, this is awesome. But guess what? He never went there. He never went there. I thank God that He's not building me a place that I'm never going to. The place that He's creating for me, the place that He's creating for you is a place that we'll spend eternity in. I go and prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm not going to leave it vacant. I'm not going to leave it abandoned. Your name is stamped on it. It's yours, and I'm coming back for you so that you can be with me forever. Which again, one more thing that we've got to point out before we move on. It is that the whole point that where I am, you may be also. The point of Jesus, what we're talking about here is basic gospel. The point of Jesus coming to earth was so that we could have access to God and spend forever with Him so that we could be in fellowship with Him. Oh, that that never be stale to us. That where I am, you may be also. Verse 5. Oh, no, verse 4. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know the way to where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You do know him and have seen him. Now, I love Thomas here. A lot of people give Thomas a bad rap. We've talked about this a couple times um, in here in, in, in different teachings about Thomas, right? Because Thomas asks the question. He asks the question that I'm sure... No one around the circle had the boldness to ask. But here, Thomas in boldness says, Listen, Jesus, I don't know if you know this. Maybe I'm slow. Right? But I don't have a clue where you're going. Like you're saying, I'm supposed to know the way to where you're going. But I, how can we know the way? And what Thomas is asking here is very simply, Can you get us home? Can you get us home? Can you take us home? Can you get us to the place where our souls are finally at rest? Can you take us home? And Jesus answers with a sentence. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And this morning, that's my outline. Simple. Not very creative. But will Jesus get us home? This call home, this desire to have our souls at rest, this desire to finally be able to just sit and breathe in and out without a care in the world. Can Jesus get us home? And Jesus' answer to that question is, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets home except through me. That's my outline. Now, before you tune me out, I want, I want, to, I want to just mention a couple things because, because here, here's the argument. Here's the argument that people outside of these four walls make with a verse like this today. That's pretty closed-minded. I mean, I mean, isn't that pretty arrogant of Jesus to stand and say, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. That's a pretty arrogant statement. Listen to me. I want to address all of that this morning, which is why the first service got out about five minutes before this service was supposed to start. And so I want you to buckle your seatbelt, and we're going to go deep, and we're going to do a deep dive into the truth behind this verse, because I believe it's extremely important for us today. Is that all right? We got until about 8.15 tomorrow night until kickoff. So we got miles of time. And I think we've got to deal with some things in this passage. The first thing he says is, I'm the way. I am the way. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is the way. Oh, come on now. Y'all, the 10.30 service, you're supposed to be wide awake, like three, four cups of coffee in to life right now. Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is the way. No, I'm the way. There you go. That's a little better. All right, so let's go to school. Jesus is the only Savior. 
the only Savior. Okay, so this is kind of sub point to point one. Jesus is the only Savior from the slavery to sin and death. <sighs> Let's pray and go home. No, don't get your hopes up. Jesus is the only Savior. Jesus is the only Savior from the slavery to sin and death. Let me try to unpack this, okay? And I'm sorry, I'm going to stay a little bit closer to my notes this morning, but, 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 but I want to make sure we get this right. There's a great chasm, okay? Chasm. There's a great divide, right? Between us and home. Between us and rest. Between us and soul level communion with our Creator. Between soul level communion with our Creator. And it's not more money. It's not a better job. It's not another town. It's not more success. It's not a better relationship. It's not better kids. It's not a better that's going to uh, uh, um, bridge that chasm. That great chasm, the great divide that robs us from home is sin and death. It has nothing to do with our job, nothing to do with our relationship, nothing to do with our money situation. It's sin and death. That's what has separated us out. And I know, I know, some of the things I say this morning are not going to be very popular. I'm super prepared for the emails. I'm going to forward them right to Rick Oshner and he will respond never. <laughs> Okay? Some of the things that we're going to talk about in here are not very popular, but it's stuff that we have to deal with. Why? Because it's in Scripture. And when Jesus makes a claim that He is the way, we've got to deal with that a little bit. And I think sometimes we're guilty. I know I am. Sometimes we're guilty of just throwing this verse out there. What Jesus says, He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. Isn't that cute? without understanding and recognize the depth of what he's getting at here. The great chasm that robs us from home is sin and death. And so unfortunately, we live in a day and age where there's no patience with that kind of language. I mean, it's easy. Mm. Let's keep going. It's easy. Who is anyone to tell us what sin is? Who is anyone to tell us what sin is? Now, when we do that, when we have that mindset, who is anyone to tell us what sin is, we erode the very humanity out from under us. How do we explain what is wrong with us if we don't have this language? How do we explain what is good and what's bad if there's no good and bad and we just decide how we feel in the day? How do we explain good and evil? Good and bad. If there's no good and bad, and it's just how we feel about it in the time or in the conversation with the person that we're talking to. Well, I don't want to make them feel bad. I don't, you know, so I'll, we'll just kind of glaze over this one a little bit. We'll just glaze over this one. The real chasm, what separates us from home is sin and death. And Jesus is the way home. He bridges the divide. He bridges the chasm. Early in this text, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, what he's not talking about is he's not talking about getting a hammer and heading up to heaven like Chip Gaines and tricking out our apartment. Some of you got that. I'm proud of you. Fixer upper reference. Chip and Joanna Gaines. The rest of you just go watch ESPN and let me know what's happening. All right? That's not, what happened. That's not what's happening here. That's not what he's getting at here. No, 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 no. I'm going to bridge the chasm of sin and death, Jesus says. I go to prepare a place for you. This is John 14, 15, and 16. He's like, I'm headed to the cross. There's 48 hours left. I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to be brutalized. I'm going to hang on a cross, and I'm going to absorb all of God's wrath toward your sin. And I'm going to be the bridge upon you. Walking across the chasm of sin and death. I believe he goes as far as to say, I'm going to make it. So not only you have a home, so that you're welcomed home. Some of you dads know what it's like. You, you've been gone for a few days and you come home and your kids have spent hours creating these little posters. They all say the same thing, but they're everywhere, right? That used to happen. It doesn't happen much anymore. <clears throat> it's a lot better having you guys in the service to talk about you. I like that. Jesus 
went to prepare a place for us so that we could be welcomed home. I go to prepare a place for you. It's not a reference to some glittery mansion in glory. No, that's not the point. That's not what he's after. It's being able to commune in that space that your soul was created for. Was created to commune in. It's about getting home. I'm the way, he says. Number two, I'm the truth. I'm thankful that he doesn't stop with I'm the way. Because he could have. He could have said, I'm the pathway. No one comes to the Father except through me. But he doesn't. He, he keeps going. And he says, I'm the truth. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the way to God because he's the truth of God. He embodies the supreme revelation of God. If I could just simplify that this morning, Jesus is God's gracious self-disclosure of Himself. Let's simplify it even more. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 1. He says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Let's simplify it even more. Jesus is God with skin on. Okay, and that's what Jesus is getting at here, saying He is the truth. You want to know what God's like? Look at Jesus. If you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. What you see in Jesus is a type of stunning, scandalous, unexplainable mercy and grace. We've already seen it, even in His disciples. Jesus is on the cusp of being slaughtered, and they're like, what do you mean? I can't believe you're going to leave us. They haven't haven't understood anything He said. And Thomas, with the boldness, "Um, Jesus, we don't know what you're talking about. Yet look at the graciousness that Jesus responds with. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus being the truth. Jesus being the truth. I want to spend some time here because I think it's a big deal. Because I think it's something that all of us us fall prey to all the time. The only true measure of righteousness. Now what are we saying there? The only right standing in God, right? That's what righteousness means. Being in right standing with God. The only person that got that completely right, fully right, was who? Jesus, right? Anytime anybody asks you a question in church, you're never wrong if you go with Jesus, okay? Just a reminder, right? Jesus. The only true measure of righteousness is Jesus. And so let's unpack that. If the only true measure of righteousness is Jesus, here's the way most of us feel righteous. You ready? We feel righteous by offering to God someone else's unrighteousness. Anybody ever done that to you? We feel righteous by offering to God someone else's unrighteousness. Here's how that looks like. Okay, here's how that looks like. Um, Here you go, God. I'm not Herb. Right? God, I'm, I'm, I'm not Herb. And I, and, I, and I even feel terrible doing this with Herb. I'm not Herb. Herb is two-faced. He's double-tongued. He's, he's wicked. There you go. I'm not him. Right? And that's how we declare ourselves righteous by unveiling or presenting to God someone else's unrighteousness. Someone else's unrighteousness. And I want you, I want you to hear me this morning because, because we've all done this at one time or another. The Bible is clear that that is filthy in the sight of God. Why? Because man-made righteousness of any kind is no righteousness at all. And this is what the prophet Isaiah means when he says all of our righteous deeds are but filthy rags. And most of us feel righteous, not because of Jesus, but because we're holding up this offering to God that we're not someone else. And listen to me, that's evil and wicked, and it will not get you home. That's evil and wicked, and it will not get you home. It just won't. The only standard of righteousness we have that is acceptable to God is the righteousness of Jesus. He who experienced every temptation that we experienced and yet remained without sin. Remained sinless. Now let me tell you why that's such good news. You ready for some good news? You need some. You're pretty wicked. (laughs) Already made that clear. Because Jesus, in His life, death, and resurrection inputs that righteousness to those who would repent of their sins and believe on His name. 
The image that I love to, to do there here is that if we trust in God, when God looks at us, He sees the cross. He, he doesn't see our past. He doesn't see our shame. He doesn't see our guilt. He doesn't see what's filling our minds right now. He sees Jesus. That's good news. That's really good news. He doesn't see our filth. He sees Jesus. He sees Jesus. That's the truth. The perfection of Jesus is granted to me so that when God sees me in Christ, all He sees is the perfect obedience of Jesus. When Jesus says, I am the truth, what He's saying is, I'm the truth to get you home. I'm the righteousness to get you home. I'm the way, I'm the truth, and then He follows it up with, I'm the life. I'm the life. Now, this is a big one. Jesus is saying here that the deliverance He's bringing is not political, not social, but it's physical. And it's spiritual life. As Christians, as Christians, we aren't to say, and, and, and some of us, I think, do this. We're, as Christians, we're not to say, okay, I'm saved. I'm a believer in Jesus. Waiting to heaven. Just waiting for heaven. I've punched my ticket. I'm at the train station. I'm waiting for the train to arrive. I'm just waiting for heaven, right? How sad is that? Yeah, some of us do that. Or, 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 or we do this, and we fall into this trap. And, and I'm sorry in advance, but I think we've got to go here. I think we've got to go here because we're missing the point if we do this. We're just missing the point. And I love you enough to tell you you're missing the point if you do this. I've heard it over and over again. Hey, I'm a Christian. I've served the church for 20 years. I'm retiring. Waiting for home. Just waiting for home. Someone else's turn is how we put it, right? Someone else's turn. That's not the point. That's not the point. Listen to me. If that, that's not what we've been saved into. If that were God's ultimate plan, then when we got saved, He would just take us right out of here. Right? And who would be left to share the gospel? Now I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you hear what I'm saying? You hear where I'm going? Right? That's not the point. First of all, that'd be freaky. Hey, come to Jesus. You're out. Right? That mo- you're out. You're gone. That's freaky. Like, if that was the theology, I mean, good for some of us, but weird. Right? Can we just acknowledge this means yes, this, that's pretty freaky. Okay, secondly, secondly, that's not what he's after. That's not what God's after. We say it all the time, right? The church has God's plan to save the world. And if the moment we met Jesus, we went to be with Him, we went home, who's left? Because He's filled us with the Holy Spirit of God and uses us as ambassadors of His good news that there's a way home. That there is a truth to be known. That there is a real life. And that it's this way. And when Jesus says, I am the life, what I want you to see here is that He's talking about the space between. He's talking about the space between when we meet Jesus and when we go home. He's talking about the space between. Clearly, in the text above verse 6, He's talking about, I'm going to come back and get you. And I'm going to come back and get you because I died and was raised. I'm going to come back and get you. And then you're going to dwell with me forever. And there's plenty of room for you. There's plenty of room for you. And Jesus has been pretty repetitive. We've pointed it out a couple of times. I'm the resurrection and the life. I offer abundant life. And here he's saying, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. What Jesus is talking about here is a deeper life. A deeper life in the space between. He's saying in the space between, while you're still here, I'm the life. Now, one of the tensions that we have to deal with with this, when we talk about this... is that all of us at one time or another when it comes to Jesus 
when it comes to when it's come to sitting in this room, when it's come to preaching a message, when it's come to sharing your faith, when it's come to trying to lead your marriage in the right way or lead your kids in the right way, all of us have dealt with this that we feel like a fraud. Who am I? I can't tell you the number of times I've woken up on a Sunday morning not wanting to come to this place, not wanting to come to this space because I've asked myself the question, who am I to share this truth? Who am I to preach this message? Who am I? Who am I? Now let me tell you, what we've got to do with that by talking about me. My righteousness is inadequate for you to get home. Let's go even deeper than that. My righteousness is inadequate for me to get home. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough for home. It's not me that gets my ticket home. I can't provide that. I can't provide that. I can't do that. I'm not, that's, that, the, my righteousness is inadequate for that. But the righteousness of Jesus gets us both there. And so the truth there is this. I don't need to be a hero to anyone. Not you, not my kids, not myself. I'm not the hero. We already have a hero. His name is Jesus. And He frees us up from having to project that we're all together when we know we're not. And I don't know about you, but I'm banking on the righteousness of Jesus and no righteousness of my own. Because I want you to see that what happens is when we're projecting physically, it takes a toll on us. When we're projecting the show, when we're having the conversation in the parking lot with the kids after fighting the whole way here, hey, it's time to straighten up. Smile's on. We're walking into church. We're going to see Lois. we got to smile. Okay? Right? That takes a toll. Stress physically affects you. The Bible says that those who fear the Lord sleep well at night. That's good news, isn't it? Those who fear the Lord sleep well at night. The psalmist will also say, when I kept quiet about my sins, when I projected, when I wouldn't admit that I was stuck, when I wouldn't be vulnerable, when I wouldn't admit that I was jammed up, my bones wasted away inside of me. There is a physical toll that bears its weight on the body when all of our energy and vitality are spent on projecting an image that isn't a reality. And I want you to know that Jesus frees us from that. When he says, I am the life, he frees us from that. I am the life. That's what he means when he says, I am the life. Then on top of all of that, hear me, hear me. I know we're going a little far with this, but hear me. On top of all of that, all of the commands of God in the scripture, all of the thou shalt statements and all of the thou shalt statements are about leading you into the deepest life possible. That's the point. The law of God leads us into safe places. When God says, hey, this way, do this, don't do that, don't do this. He's not trying to take anything from you. He's trying to lead you into the life as He designed it to be. It would not serve the purposes of God for you to live a life begrudging submission when you're afraid He's going to blow up your life or, or give you a disease if you don't do what He says. Here's the Word of God saying this way to life. And we're just like, I don't think so. But we're not finished. And it's the last statement here that really causes a lot of problems for people. It's the last statement here that really messes with people. We have Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, He's the life. He's leading us home. But that's not all. Then you have this crazy statement. No one gets home except through Jesus. No one gets home except through Jesus. Now, 
again, I want to create space for you that if you haven't been a Christian or you're not a Christian or maybe you haven't been around Christians a lot, maybe you haven't been a Christian for very long and maybe in this moment you're thinking, man, Travis, you can't be serious. This is 2019, man. You're still thinking in the backwoods. You're still thinking in the 80s or 70s or way back when to say that there's no other way than Jesus. Surely you don't believe that. I just can't believe that a guy in 2019 would boldly preach something so absurd. But here's why it's important for us to talk about this morning. I believe it's so important for us to hit this this morning. The world's major religions are built on the antithesis of what the Christian religion is built out of. Here's what I mean by that. At the center of most of the world's religions is what's called moralistic deism. Did you get that? Moralistic deism. Be good enough to be accepted by this God. That's moralistic deism. Be good enough to be accepted by this God. And here's the list of things that I, that if I do these things, God will accept me. That's Islam, that's Judaism. So many people ask the question, hey pastor, how many Sundays a year do I need to come for God to be pleased with me? All of them. How do you like that answer? Right? I don't know. I don't know. But let me know because then I'll come that many Sundays. If you think it's twice a month, I'll come twice a month. That'll work, right? I can do twice a month. You can do twice a month and we'll flip-flop and then we'll be good, right? God will be pleased with us. That's not the point. You see that? You see how ridiculous that is? That's not the point. But that's Islam, that's Judaism. If you do these things, if you'll just do these things, then God will accept you in. What does that do though? That forces us back to self-righteousness. It forces us to try to forge a righteousness of our own, to build a bridge on our own, to, to try to cross that chasm on our own. And when we do that, we have no choice but to live a duplicitous life, a deceitful life. When we do that, we have no choice. So listen, and I'm going to try to land the plane in the next half hour. Listen, I've already kind of touched on this for a second. I love you. But I love you enough to tell you that you're terrible at being good. You're not good at it. You're terrible at being good. And the sooner that we can come, become self-aware to that, that we're nobody's hero and that we need Jesus, our righteousness is not good enough, the better off we'll be. We're just not good at being good. We're not. So, let's have a little fun. Let's take a pop quiz. We're going to call this the Ten Commandments pop quiz. Some of y'all just got really excited because you're like, oh, if he calls on me, I got them all. I got all ten. Nope, not that kind of quiz. Here's how we're going to play. Here's how we're going to play. Do you love things with more dedication and more fervor than you love God? Of course you do. At some point or another, at one point or another, of course you do. I know the answer to that. Are you guilty of taking the Lord's name in vain? That means that we would treat the name of God lightly. Maybe that can fit in in that category, but it's more like an indifference toward God, a lack of reverence for God. That's absolutely true for every one of us. That we would take the name of God lightly. Look, I know you're not a liar. You just lie sometimes. Right? 55 and a 45... Hey, pastor, good sermon. I know you're lying. Okay? But that doesn't mean you're a liar. I know, I know, I know. You're not a liar. Just every once in a while, you lie. Okay, maybe you haven't committed adultery, maybe, but, but your hearts are filled with lust. Maybe you haven't murdered anybody, but your heart is filled with anger. You, at times, get really frustrated when good things happen to people when, who, who, who you don't think good things should happen to, and you love it when bad things happen to people who you think deserve them. That's called coveting. Another Ten Commandment. 
Why? Because it puts you in a position of God to judge others. We could just keep going and going and going. The point is, we're always going to get a zero. Even if we said, okay, God, let me come back next week. Even if he looked at you and said, okay, same pop quiz next week, open notes. Still a zero. Still a zero. Over and over and over again, we'll fail the test. Here's why. The Ten Commandments were not given to you because you were going to be able to obey them, but to show you that at the very base level, you'd never be able to. The point is that we all get a zero. The reason here Jesus can say that moralistic deism, being good enough, can't get you home is because the human heart can't rest in any other righteousness than Jesus. The second thing, no one comes to the Father except through me that we have to be really careful of. As we live in a place and and a time in which radical individualism rules the day. We live in a place and time in which radical individualism rules the day. Now, we've got to get something really clear here. I'm not against individualism. In fact, I think Christianity was founded on it. But individualism left unchecked by the truth of God's word turns absurd. Here's how I defined it in my notes. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to write this down. Individualism is to prioritize the desires of self over all else. Then I added this, including reality. Let me read that again. Individualism is to prioritize the desires of self over all else, including reality. Let me try to explain what I mean by that. Individualism is nobody tells me I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. I'll decide what's right for me. I know how to get myself home. I'll just pull up myself by my bootstraps and I'll do my best. But when you radicalize individualism, it starts to fall downstream. You no longer have any category for mental illness because everything is just a personal decision, personal choice, self-identity. That's not the way, the truth, and the life. When Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes to the Father except through me, it's not a pronouncement of judgment. It's an invitation home. Individualism will not get you there. You can't get yourself home. And that's why on Friday, when I get a call at 2.30 in the afternoon, and on the other, here, on, on the other line, I hear, hey, my dad went home to be with Jesus this morning. the first thing that hits me is sadness, right? Dan used to sit in that corner right over there and play bass guitar, and he would sing at the top of his lungs at every song. And then he would sit out here and he'd fall asleep during every message. (laughs) But the second thing that hits is jealousy. Because Dan's home. He got home. And the point of this verse that I think so often we miss is the space between. First of all, like we said, it's an invitation home. So the point is for us this morning, are you going home? If you died today, is your destination home? The second point, though, we can't forget. The truth, the life, is the space between. How are we doing at sharing the destination? How are we doing at making sure everybody has a destination of home that we come in contact with? You see where I'm going with that? That's love. And that's life. I wrote a paragraph here that I want to read. 
this past week that I think kind of sums it up, everything we've talked about this morning. If you find yourself in a restlessness, a weariness of yourself, an exhaustion from kind of fronting, feeling like a fraud, that you're all together and so well put together and so successful, if you're finally tired enough of that, I just want to lay before you God's invitation to come home. A better version of you will not solve that angst in your soul. More religious activity will not solve that angst in your soul. Moralistic deism or being good enough will not solve that angst in your soul. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets home without Him. That's not arrogant. It's gracious. No greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that He could be the way, the truth, and the life and give access to the Father. What an invitation. Worship team is going to come. And um, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to. I just want to do this, and we're going to have some people at the doors to pray. If that serves you during the song, if that serves you at the end of the service, but if you're sitting here this morning and you say, "You know what? I've never, I've never accepted the invitation home. I've never looked at Jesus as being the truth, the way, the life." But today, I want to say, you know what? Home is my destination. Heaven is my destination. And I want to give my life to Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed in this room, if that's you and you say, you know what, today I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to go home. I want to go home. And in the space between, I'll make much of Jesus, not of me. I'll make much of Jesus. If that's you this morning. And you say, I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. Would you just lift up your hand? Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Okay. So if our destination is home, my prayer is that we make so much of the space between. Maybe God's calling you to a deeper life this morning. Maybe God's calling you to make more of Him this morning. Whatever that is, would you answer that call? Father, I pray right now that you speak to us. That you call us deeper. I thank you that you're the way. I thank you that you're the truth. I thank you that you're the life. I thank you that you're the way to the Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us this morning?
Amen. Amen. Hey, I, I just want to do something different, if that's all right. As we, as we close in prayer, I want you to think of a name. I want you to think of a name. Just one name, not ten names. Don't be an overachiever. Okay, just one name of someone that you know needs to hear the truth of what we talked about this morning. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. And as I pray, I want you to lift that name up to Him. As I pray, I want you to lift that name up to Him. I've got my name. I just want you to lift that name up to Him. So as we pray...